Hello everyone. So in the last recording we saw mutual funds and ETFs exchange traded funds. So we are going into other managed products in this chapter. So chapter 20 is all about other managed products. So in this chapter we are going to discuss different types of segregated funds. What is a segregated fund? Then we are going to discuss hedge funds, labor sponsored venture capital fund, close ended funds, income trust and listed private equity. So before we start with segregated funds, just to recap managed products. So all managed products are effectively a pool of capital that is put together by investors. It is given to a fund manager and fund manager on behalf of every investor makes investments. Whatever return that investments generate that are transferred to investors. So all managed products are effectively a pool of fund that is managed by a fund manager. Now we have seen mutual funds and exchange traded funds. So both of them do not have any kind of guarantee. So whatever investments you make into a mutual fund or an exchange traded fund, they do not come with any kind of guarantee. So capital you invest is always at risk. Now, if you see segregated funds, they are considered to be an insurance product. So they are combination of insurance and investments. Features that they have, they have maturity protection. So maturity amount is protected, it's guaranteed. Maturity amount is generally a percentage of amount you invest in. So amount, a percentage of amount you invest in is always protected or guaranteed. There are death benefits. So if a if the person who has take bought this segregated fund or dies means person on whose name the segregated fund is dies then the beneficiaries get certain death benefits and because it is an insurance product it has creditor protection so creditors cannot claim this product so these products are formed as trust and they do not come that means what happens is in an insurance company when you buy a segregated fund so your um, the investments that the fund makes it is not in your name it is in the name of insurance company that's the reason they are not attached if the creditor sues you and they have creditor protection so regulations of segregated funds so they are individual variable insurance contract so each time you buy a segregated fund you make a contract with an insurance company they are regulated by provincial insurance regulator now this is a key difference mutual funds and etfs are regulated by provincial securities regulators and insurance contracts are not regulated by securities because they are not investment products so segregated funds are regulated by provincial insurance regulator canadian life and health insurance association provides guidelines which are accepted by most of the provinces so this is an sro in case of mutual funds it is mfda mutual funds dealers association in terms of segregated funds it is canadian life and health insurance association office of the superintendent of financial institutions is, rep is responsible to see capital adequacy of insurance company under federal insurance companies act then there is asuris asuris is an insurance industry self-financing provider covers only death benefit and maturity benefit so what does asuris do asuris protects you as a segregated fund buyer in case of there is default from the insurance company so if insurance company files for bankruptcy and defaults then you are protected protection is 60,000 or 85 percent of guaranteed amount whichever is whichever is lower is protected structure of segregated fund so there is a concept of notional unit so like I said when you buy a segregated fund 
the pro investment proceeds are always in the name of insurance company you do not get you do not make investments in your own name so in such a case the insurance company does not give you actual units but they give you notional units now these notional units are given so that it is easy to track performance of segregated funds now different parties that are involved in segregated funds so there is a contract holder the person who is responsible for buying the segregated fund there is an annuitant the person whose life is insured and then is then there is beneficiary the person who gets benefit out of this fund who is named as a beneficiary now contract holder and annuitant can be same so i can buy segregated funds in my own name or i can buy segregated funds in my wife's name in this case the contract holder and the annuitant is different so there should be an insurable interest in in case of annuitant and the contract holder so i cannot buy insurance on some third xyz person that i don't know and name is as name him as an annuitant because there won't be any insurable interest now features of segregated fund so there are maturity guarantees so provincial regulations have that at least 75% of amount investment amount invested in a 10 plus year period or on death is guaranteed so provincial regulation says minimum 75% of what you invest in segregated fund if the maturity is after 10 years or in case of death is guaranteed now most of the provincial most of the segregated funds have much higher guarantee than that they generally have 100% guarantee so in a segregated fund the amount you invest is all miss is most of the times guaranteed regulations re, regulations permit that 75% should be guaranteed but in practice generally 100% is guaranteed age restrictions so no more than 80 year old so if you are buying a segregated funds they are generally not available beyond the age of 80 and as your age progresses the protection reduces so there is reduced protection as you age now there is a concept of reset date so if i have 30 years to go for my retirement and i can buy segregated funds in chunks of 10 years so every 10 year i can reset my segregated fund so what happens when you reset whatever lock in value would be there of the fund on reset date that would be frozen as guaranteed amount so example i start a segregated fund with $10000 after 10 years on maturity the fair market value of that segregated fund is 20000 and i put a reset so what happens now the 20000 becomes the invested amount and then 20000 is guaranteed not the 10000 so i can lock in my current market value on reset dates now in segregated fund there is concept of death benefit so death benefit is always guaranteed amount minus fair market value and death benefit arises in case the guaranteed amount is more than fair market value if guaranteed amount is less than fair market value then death benefit is not there now what does death benefit means so in case of death you are provided with guaranteed amount or the market value of the fund whichever is higher so if your market value of the fund is 120000 and guaranteed amount is 100000 then you are provided 120000 in that case the death benefit from the fund is zero okay but if the market value of the fund is 90000 and guaranteed amount is 100000 then you would be provided 100000 though the funds are only worth 90000 the difference of 10000 will be provided as death benefit 
So death benefit is always difference between guaranteed amount and fair market value. So in this case death benefit is 0, 100,000 minus 100,000. In this case death benefit is 10,000. 100,000 minus 90,000, 10,000. In this case, death benefit is again zero because fair market value is greater than guaranteed amount. One more significance of death benefit, death benefits are not taxable in Canada. So whatever death benefits you get, they are not taxed. And maturity amount is taxed. Creditor protection, so Segregated funds have creditor protection. So under bankruptcy and family law, they are protected. So segregated funds are not attached to your properties in case of bankruptcy or if creditor is putting a lawsuit against you. Now, there is a condition that segregated funds should be bought in good faith to qualify for credit protection segregated funds should be bought in good faith to qualify for credit protection means you cannot buy a segregated fund before one year of bankruptcy so if there is a bankruptcy and segregated funds have been bought one year before the purchase then they will not have any credit protection they will come under bankruptcy assets and if you are already legally insolvent means you have already not, you are not a legally solvent person and you still buy segregated funds then they will not have any credit protection. Also important thing segregated funds bypass probate. So probate is a process whereby you prove or disprove a bill uh, a will in courts. So whatever will is there you prove or disprove it in court. So segregated funds do not form part of will asset. Also important thing there is no actual units that are distributed when you buy segregated funds there are deemed units or so deemed units right so whatever allocations you get so dividend capital gain or interest so it is deemed income so it is called as deemed allocation so allocation it is deemed income and AB does not fall so important thing in both mutual fund and in ETF whenever distributions are made NAV generally falls but in case of segregated funds NAV does not fall so fund contract receives additional income and generally whatever allocations you get like dividend capital gains or interest they increase adjusted cost basis of the fund okay tax treatments of guarantees they are taxable as capital gain and tax treatment of death benefits death benefits are tax free now comparison between an segregated fund and a mutual fund so legal status it is an insurance contract mutual fund it is a securities owner of the fund its insurance company in mutual fund the fund owns it so indirectly when you buy it you own it nature of fund units there is no legal status in segregated fund and mutual fund it's a legal property regulator it is provincial insurance regulator in case of mutual fund it is provincial securities regulator issuer it is insurance companies that issue segregated fund in case of mutual fund it is mutual fund companies main disclosure it is information folder and in mutual fund it is fund fact documents so this is also a big difference so mutual funds have fund fact documents and segregated funds have insurance folders frequency of valuation segregated funds are valued daily mutual funds are also valued daily redemption it is upon request mutual fund it is upon request required financial statements so segregated funds need audited annual statements mutual funds have audited annual and unaudited semi-annual sellers qualification you need to be a licensed insurance agent plus you need courses like CSC in mutual fund you need to be a licensed mutual fund rep guaranteed amount yes it is there in segregated funds it is not there in mutual funds 
protection against insu issuer insolvency it is provided by asuris means if the insurance company defaults your amount means some amount is provided by some kind of insurance is provided by asuris in case of mutual fund it is provided by mfda investor protection corporation then there are death benefits in segregated funds there are no death benefits in mutual fund credit protection is there in segregated funds credit protection is not there in mutual fund it bypass probates it doesn't bypass probate next is hedge funds now only thing you have to remember is hedge funds are similar to mutual funds so there is a pool of money there is a fund manager and fund manager makes investment decisions but important thing they are not constrained by rules so they have very less regulations for example if you invest in a mutual fund mutual funds have lot of investment restrictions a mutual fund cannot buy more than 10% of a stock in a company so it cannot have concentrated positions it cannot buy more than 10% voting rights it cannot short sell it cannot use leverage it cannot use derivatives beyond permissible use it cannot invest in commodities it cannot take exposure to currencies so there are a lot of restrictions that are put on that are put on mutual funds hedge funds do not have such restrictions so they can take concentrated positions they can invest more than 10% in one company they can have more than 10% voting rights in one company so they can invest in they can short sell they can use leverage they can invest in currencies so they can take exposure in commodities so they are not constrained by rules so mutual funds you are allowed to take short positions leverage you can use derivatives beyond permissible use so all these things are possible in hedge funds investing in hedge funds so sales is allowed without prospectus for exempted investors so if if you are selling okay before going into that you are not allowed to sell hedge funds to retail clients the investor whom you are selling hedge fund as an advisor needs to be a sophisticated or an accredited investor so if you are selling hedge funds to an accredited or a sophisticated investor you do not need prospectus now what is an accredited investor in canada it is 1 million in assets 1 million in net assets or 200000 of annual income and 300000 if it is joint account including spouse minimum investment exemption is there under national instrument 45106 that is even if the investor doesn't qualify as an accredited investor but he is putting 150000 investments investment straight investment into a hedge fund he can still invest then hedge funds do not offer prospectus they are, they are exempt from even offering they are they generally offer memorandum so hedge funds are sold by offering memorandums they are not sold by offering prospectus benefits and risk in by investing in hedge funds benefit the correlation with traditional assets is very low so hedge funds have very low correlations with traditional assets and other biggest benefit that hedge funds have is absolute returns so mutual funds are will always have some kind of relative return so mutual fund will always be just against some benchmark so that is their objective hedge funds generally have absolute return objective so irrespective of what benchmark does or irrespective of what market does hedge fund will have objective of getting let's say 4% return per year right minimum so irrespective of market going up down or sideways hedge fund has to attain that objective so objectives of hedge fund is absolute returns irrespective of market conditions risk their regulation is lighter or regulatory oversight there is manager and market risk so hedge fund investments are heavily dependent on managers so if manager quits then it becomes very difficult to replace him and the performance may fall also there is market risk 
so even though they have absolute return objectives there is still market risk there the investment strategies are quite complex so they involve complex investment strategies there are liquidity constraints so they are not as liquid as mutual funds so there are lock in periods when you invest in hedge funds so there are liquidity constraints then there is business risk business risk means most of the mutual funds are big companies hedge funds if you see many of them are startups so there is higher risk of failure in case of startups so there is additional business risk when you invest in hedge funds now a key component of hedge fund is incentive fees what is incentive fees along with performance along with management expense ratio mers and along with commissions you also have to give incentives to fund managers of hedge funds now incentives are dependent on performance of hedge fund so in a mutual fund you do not means a fund manager is not awarded if the mutual fund performs really well because mutual funds have commission structures for sales agents and have mers that is management expense ratio or fund management fees for fund managers but in case of hedge funds they have additional incentives if hedge fund performs really well so there is incentive fees based on performance in case of hedge funds which is which is not there in case of mutual funds now for incentive fees there is a concept of high water mark and there is concept of hurdle rate so what i'll do is i'll go to excel and try to explain it to you So what is high water mark? So let's say the fund was invested for five years, and it started with four hundred million. It went to four twenty million, then it dropped to three eighty million, and it went back to four twenty, and finally the performance was. it went to 475 million so this was the fund performance of hedge fund it started with 400 million then it went to 420 then it went down to 380 then it came to 420 and then it came to 475 so what is high water mark in case of high water mark if you are considering performance of a particular year highest value before that highest fund value before that will be the water mark so let's say you're considering performance of the hedge fund in second year you are calculating incentive fees for performance of the hedge fund in second year so whatever value the fund has before this second year will be the high water mark so in case of second year high water mark will be 400 million because that was the value previous to that year of the fund highest value now in case of third year the water mark will be 420 because if you are calculating fund performance in third year then the water mark is previous highest value of the fund so that is 420 the water mark in third year will be 420 water mark in fourth year will also be 420 because previous highest value is still 420 so if you are calculating incentive fees it will be still 420 and water mark in fifth year will still be 420 because that is the highest value before this so what is a high water mark high water mark means if you are looking at a performance of a hedge fund in particular year highest value of that hedge fund before that year will be water mark now what does high water mark means that if the fund beats the previous highest value only then it will be paid incentive fees 
फॉर एग्जाम्पल विल इंसेंटिव फीस बी पेड इन सेकेंड ईयर येस बिकॉज द वॉटर मार्क वॉज फोर हंड्रेड ईयर फोर हंड्रेड मिलियन एंड द वैल्यू इज फोर ट्वेंटी सो इट इज अबव हायर वॉटर मार्क सो इंसेंटिव फिल फीस विल बी पेड इन सेकेंड ईयर थर्ड ईयर इट वेंट डाउन टू थ्री एटी सो विल इंसेंटिव फीस बी पेड नो बिकॉज वॉटर मार्क इज फोर ट्वेंटी एंड द करेंट फंड वैल्यू इज थ्री एटी सो इंसेंटिव फीस विल नॉट बी पेड इन फोर्थ ईयर इट इज फोर ट्वेंटी सो फंड वैल्यू वेंट अप फ्रॉम थ्री एटी टू फोर ट्वेंटी सो फंड डिड ग्रो इन साइज बट इट इज स्टिल नॉट बीटिंग द वॉटर मार्क ऑफ फोर ट्वेंटी सो इंसेंटिव फीस विल नॉट बी पेड इन फिफ्थ ईयर इंसेंटिव फीस विल बी पेड बिकॉज वॉटर मार्क इज फोर ट्वेंटी एंड द फंड वैल्यू इज फोर सेवेंटी फाइव सो दिस इज हाउ अ हाई वॉटर मार्क इज यूज नेक्स्ट कंसेप्ट इज हर्डल रेट हर्डल रेट मीन्स इट इज द मिनिमम रेट बियॉन्ड विच इंसेंटिव आर फेड फॉर एग्जाम्पल इफ अ फंड गिवस टेन परसेंट रेट ऑफ रिटर्न इट फंड ग्रोस टेन परसेंट एंड द हर्डल रेट इज फाइव परसेंट सो इंसेंटिव विल बी पेड ऑन वॉट एवर परफॉर्मेंस इज देर अबव द हर्डल रेट बट इफ फंड परफॉर्म्ड थ्री परसेंट इफ फंड ग्रो थ्री परसेंट and the hurdle rate is 5% there will be no incentives if it is 10% there will be incentives okay so hurdle rate is the minimum rate you have to achieve as a fund manager to get incentives and high water mark means it is the previous high of fund value that you have to beat to get incentives Okay. Now this is an interesting question. How much must a fund earn if the high water mark is ten percent above the current value, and hurdle rate is three percent? So fund must earn ten percent plus three percent, thirteen percent, before it gets any incentives. tax implications of hedge funds it's quite complex because it it depends where the funds invest in but certain hedge funds use tax deferral so they invest in offshore investments and they use tax deferral so you don't have to pay tax unless and until you bring money back into canada so they use that structure there is short selling and leverage in hedge funds now hedge fund strategies can be relative value strategy in relative value strategy you arbitrage so you buy an asset in one market and you sell it in another and it is exactly same so long and short is exactly same so it is generally called as a risk free strategy and the market risk or beta of this risk is almost zero so this works in upward market sideways markets as well as downward market so relative value strategy means arbitrage buying in one market selling in another buying one asset selling other asset okay event driven strategies is generally done on particular events like mergers and acquisition for example if an acquisition is happening so A company is buying B company. So, as a hedge fund manager, you will buy the target shares, B company shares, because generally after mergers, the target shares appreciate. So, it is based on mergers and acquisitions or any other corporate actions. Directional strategies is where you go long and short simultaneously, but long and short are not of exact same dollar amount or exact same value. for example if you are going 100 dollars long and 50 dollars short then it is a directional strategy because long is more than short same way if you are going 100 dollars short and 50 dollars long then it is still a directional strategy because short is more than long now now in case of directional strategy i'll again go to excel because there is a concept of hedged portion an unhedged portion
for example if you're putting hundred dollars if this is your trade you're going hundred dollars long and you're going hundred dollars sixty dollars short so you're going more long than you're going short so what will be unhedged portion unhedged portion is always difference between the two whatever is long bigger long or short minus whatever is shorter whatever is small so difference between the two in hun is unhedged portion hedge portion is this lesser amount between long and short so hedge portion is 60 that doesn't have any market risk and unhedged portion is 40 that does have market risk now if, if this is the case you're going hundred dollars short and you're covering it up with eighty dollars long so this is your trade so it is still a directional trade because long and short are not same if they are same then it is a relative value trade now what will you do unhedged portion will be difference 80 100 minus 80 and hedge portions will be the lower amount between 100 and 80 that is 80 okay so there are three strategies relative value strategy so long and short or buying in one market selling in another so it is called as arbitrage but they are of the same value market risk is relatively low event driven strategies done on specific events like mergers acquisitions etc market risk is medium it does have exposure to market directional strategies have exposure to market and it is going long and going short on the same stock uh, I means on similar stocks but not of the exact same amount now funds of funds so these are have, these are mutual funds that invest in hedge funds minimum amount to invest is generally around 25,000 there can be a single strategy multi manager fund so such type of hedge funds invest in the same strategy for example if they only invest in relative value hedge funds but they invest in multi managers so they invest in different hedge funds or there can be a multi strategy multi manager fund that invests in different strategies and then different managers within those strategies now what are funds of hedge funds these are mutual funds that invest in hedge funds so they reduce the risk that you are exposed to as a hedge fund investor to a single manager advantage of investing in funds of hedge funds so there is proper due diligence it is difficult for a single person to do due diligence on hedge funds because there are less regulations and they are not very transparent so risk of due diligence is quite low if you're if a mutual fund who is a if a fund manager who is qualified does it for you reduced volatility they are less volatile than individual hedge funds there is professional management they have access to hedge funds now like I have said hedge funds are generally small startups so it is sometimes difficult to get access to those hedge funds so they have better access ability to diversify with smaller amount by smaller amount you can invest in 10 different hedge funds or 20 different hedge funds and there is manager and business risk control disadvantage there is additional cost still there is no guarantee of positive returns there is low or no strategy diversification if you are investing in a single strategy multi manager fund of fund then there is no diversification of strategy there can be insufficient or excessive diversification so you can have a fund of fund only having 10 hedge funds or you can have a fund of fund having 1000 hedge funds so in case of that there is excessive diversification and they can have additional source of leverage so they can borrow money and then invest in hedge funds so that creates additional leverage so difference between a mutual fund and a hedge fund so mutual fund short position is limited 
you cannot there is limited use of short positions in close and dead funds and generally they cannot use short sell hedge funds can do short selling use of derivatives is limited up to 10% of fund value hedge funds they can use derivatives liquidity is high in case of mutual funds liquidity is quite restricted so they have low liquidity in case of hedge funds sales method they are sold with fund facts to general public hedge funds are sold with memorandums to sophisticated investors so this is a big difference they use fund fact document they use memorandum they are sold to general public they are sold to sophisticated investor regulatory oversight is more in mutual fund it is less in hedge funds fees you share you have management fees in mutual fund you have management as well as performance fees in hedge fund return objectives are relative in case of mutual funds they are absolute in case of hedge funds valuation mutual funds have daily valuation hedge funds have monthly valuation disclosure mutual funds generally have quarterly or annual disclosure hedge funds disclose their holdings annually so they disclose to public annually position concentration is not allowed in mutual fund it is allowed in hedge funds next is labor sponsored venture capital corporations so these are structured to provide capitals for small to mid size and emerging companies and these are structured by labor organizations as well as labor unions of provinces advantage is is if you invest in labor sponsored venture capital corporation you get a federal tax credit of 15% along with that most of the provinces you also get provincial tax credit i am in alberta so it is not there in alberta as well as it is not there in ontario disadvantage these are high risk and these are speculative investments because they invest in small and mid size companies there is redemption res restrictions so if you redeem before 8 years you have to pay back that tax credit so that tax credit you have to there is a clawback on that tax credit if you sell it before 8 years and they have higher cost next is close ended mutual funds so this these are midway between open ended mutual funds and etf so close ended mutual fund works you give money to a fund manager fund manager issues you units those units are listed on stock exchange so it provides liquidity by listing its units on stock exchange difference between an etf and an close ended mutual funds etf like we saw in last class they have in kind redemption and creation process close ended mutual funds do not have in kind creation and redemption process advantage they have lower management fees than an open ended mutual fund important fact they mostly trade at a discount to nav even though they are listed their units are listed on exchanges they trade at a discount to nav and this discount generally increases in a bear market ability to buy back so there can be an interval or a close ended discretionary fund which has certain buyback provisions into it because generally close ended funds do not have buyback provisions so when they get money from investors and they issue units that's it investors cannot go back to fund and ask for money but certain close ended funds can have internal can have buyback mechanism then if they have buyback then they are called as interval or close ended discretionary funds advantages so they have advantage of diversification short selling is allowed in close ended mutual fund they have less cash drag so most of the funds that the close ended mutual fund gets they are invested so they have less cash drag they have long term outlook and capital gain and dividend are directly paid to investors there is no reinvestment so adjusted cost basis is easy to calculate disadvantage bear market as i have discussed they generally trade at a discount to their nav when they trade on exchange but this discount generally amplifies when there is bear market 
they are less required there is no reinvestment risk so reinvestment risk is low so no schedule for declining deferred sales fees so they are less liquid even though they are traded on stock exchanges the liquidity is quite low reinvestment of dividends or capital gains doesn't happen so it is directly paid into your account then generally mutual funds have declining sales commission or declining back end loads when you sell the mutual fund you have to in certain cases you have to pay certain commissions and they go down as the time period of holding increases but in case of close ended mutual funds it is fixed so there is no schedule for declining sales deferral fees if traded on foreign exchange they are considered to have foreign income next is income trust income trust is like mutual funds so they pool money and then they invest but investments are not done in stocks and bonds they are done in either real estates either conventional real estate like commercial or residential real estate properties or it is done in assets of business not stocks and bonds of a business directly asset of a business so reits reits is real estate investment trust so these are mutual funds that invest in actual real estate so they buy commercial and residential properties they are good hedge against inflation because of real estate investments they have better liquidity than the real estate properties because they are traded on exchange and they have professional management business trust is similar to reits but instead of buying actual real estate they buy business assets so they may may buy a restaurant they may buy some supply chain or they may buy cars etc and whatever income they generate from that asset they keep taxation generally income tax income trust are taxed like canadian companies so they have to pay tax but there is a pass through status for reits if they distribute income so in case of reits if they are distributing income then they have a pass through status so there is no taxation that reit has to pay but whatever distributions the investor gets they are taxed in investors hand next is listed private equity so private equity generally invest in unlisted companies listed private equity means this private equity is then traded on stock exchange so it has little bit of more liquidity strategies that listed private equity invest in leverage buyout so taking on loans and buying a company or combination of loan and equity to buy a company growth capital providing capital for growing companies turn around investing in out of favor industries and hoping for a turn around in means investing in out of favor distressed stocks and hoping for a turn around early stage venture capital investing in companies that have yet to prove that idea late stage venture capital investing in companies that have little bit track record but they are still not profitable distressed debt buying debt of government or of companies that is currently under stress advantages it is you can get access to legitimate insider information private equity can have concentrated positions and private equity difference between a private equity firm and a mutual fund is mutual funds does not take part in day to day means in strategic decisions of the company that they invest in but private equity players they take part in running the business so they have access to insider information and that is legitimate they can have influence over management and flexibility of impl implementation so they get all business plans from management they can discuss with management so also all such flexibility is there disadvantage this though they are traded on stock exchange some of them but they are still illiquid and there is dependence on keep personnel so they have manager risk if the manager leaves then the strategy goes along with them so that is it in chapter 20 we'll discuss more about other managed products in 
21